Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the content patch for the 17th of September 2013. My name is Total Biscuit with today's gaming news and comment. Coming up in the show, Rockstar warns about problems installing the GTA 5 Play Disc on an Xbox 360. Terraria's 1.2 gameplay trailer has been released. JJ Abrams was disappointed in the recent Star Trek game, and we'll be having a look at the upcoming releases for the week. All this in the OC Remix track of the day is coming your way right about now. In perhaps a demonstration of the lengths that Rockstar have had to go in order to make GTA 5 run properly on 8-year-old hardware, Rockstar has warned that installing the play disc for GTA 5 is a particularly bad idea. The reason being that the game uses a system which streams data from both the hard drive and the DVD simultaneously, which allows for the game to actually keep up with everything. If you install both discs on the hard drive, which can be done through an optional procedure via the Xbox dashboard, you will run into various graphical problems, including tearing and obvious texture pop-in. This is because attempting to get all of the textures off the hard drive at once will result in the game not actually being able to keep up. According to Rockstar, the actual game itself was deliberately designed so that a lot of the data was stored on the disk and then the rest of it is loaded in tandem from the hard drive. So in doing so, you actually get a faster result by using both of these methods of data transfer versus just putting them both on the same hard drive, which would result in overall slower performance. Some people are concerned that this might affect the PlayStation 3 version, which of course is only on one Blu-ray as opposed to two DVDs. The installation process may be available on the PlayStation 3 as well, but one has to wonder what method they use there. It is entirely possible that the install might only be part of the title, and the system would operate in a fairly similar fashion to the Xbox, except it would only use that one single disc. Interesting look at the technology behind that, isn't it? In an age of faster hard drives, SATA 3 and SSDs, the Xbox 360 and the PlayStation 3 are somewhat behind. The default hard drive in an Xbox 360 would be a 5400 RPM as opposed to a 7200 RPM, and they also run SATA version 2 as opposed to SATA version 3, which would be a 3 gigabit per second versus a 6 gigabit per second transfer rate. It's kind of crazy to think about, really, when a lot of PC gamers have moved over to SSDs for their gaming experience, that these particular devices are very much still running on rather old hard drive technology. I suppose for a world as large as GTA, you really have to go to that point. I wonder if there's any other games that do that. It seems interesting that Rockstar would have to come out and say, please don't do this. I haven't necessarily heard of any other instances of this occurring, but it may very well be that GTA 5 is kind of the pinnacle of what these machines can actually achieve. Graphically, it looks pretty damn impressive for a console title, and of course, we are talking about a large world, even though the draw distance isn't so great and popping certainly does exist. Be aware of that if you're going to pick it up on console, since there is currently no PC release date for this title. We assume that it's going to come, but we don't know when. I know a lot of people might just kind of throw it in and grab the console version regardless. Personally, I won't be. Those of you asking whether or not there'll be a WTF is of the title, there will be if it comes to PC. There won't be if it doesn't. Really as simple as that. This is a PC channel after all. And you know, it'll be kind of nice to actually experience the game once all the hype has died down. I don't really want to play it on a console. I think if you're going to talk about one of the most expensive games of all time, the last thing you want to do is play it on eight-year-old hardware where it wouldn't be the original vision, I suppose, of the creator. I wonder if any of the guys over at Rockstar are upset that it's not coming out on PC at launch. It's, it just seems like you would create this masterpiece of, say, cinematography and use all the latest techniques and spend a bunch of money and everything about it's perfect. You know, take it as an example of a movie, for instance. Everything about it's perfect, like perfect special effects, perfect makeup art. Everything is shot absolutely perfectly. The cinematography is mind-blowing and you've spent so much money and time making this happen and then people experience it by watching on a phone at low resolution or whatever. Because that seems to me like what GTA 5 is right now. You spend all this money and people get to experience it in 720p at 30 frames per second. I mean, really? Is that all you wanted for your game? Probably not. I imagine there's a lot of people in Rockstar that are absolutely itching to get it on PC so that they can really unleash everything and just say, look at how awesome this is. But hey, that's just the reality of the industry right now. And Rockstar has unfortunately repeatedly shown that they do not want to release titles on PC at the same time as console. As to why, we can only really speculate on that one. 
Ubisoft did similar things back in the day. They delayed the version by a couple of weeks, but at least we knew that the version was actually coming. In that scenario, it was done for a couple of reasons. One being to sort of reduce piracy. Second, to try and force the people that were really, really itching to get their hands on the game to buy the console version and then maybe buy the PC version later on. This can also be important from a chart perspective. If you've got less formats, you're more likely to push it higher up the overall charts. But Rockstar's a weird one, because they're a multi-platform company, yet they have shown no concern for PC whatsoever. GTA 5 eventually came out, the port was terrible, and still doesn't run all that well on a myriad of systems. Red Dead never came out. L.A. Noire, of course, was not technically done by Rockstar, it was published by it. The PC port of that was not particularly good either. But I guess their strategy is working, because apparently they've raked in more money from pre-orders than the game actually cost before the game even bloody came out. So, there you go. Last comment I'd like to make on GTA 5, just for the sake of actually talking about it, because I feel that it's worth bringing attention to the disgusting behavior that's currently going on, is what's happening to any review that even has the audacity to suggest that the game is anything less than perfect. And we're not just talking about the idea of saying, oh yeah, it's a 9 out of 10. Apparently that's insulting to people because it's not a 10 out of 10, but whatever the case, we can ignore those idiots. The concern that I've got is specifically for the GameSpot review, which resulted in a bunch of transphobia in the comments because the reviewer happened to be transgender. So apparently it's entirely okay to claim a human being is something less than human and demean them as a person simply because they didn't give the game that you have not played yet a 10 out of 10. To those, the cancer of the so-called gaming community, I do firmly say, fuck off. It's finally here, almost anyway, the patch, or some would say the sequel to Terraria, simply because of the sheer ridiculous amount of content that's in it, is coming on October the 1st. The update will be free for all Terraria users on PC and contains an absolute absurd amount of new content. It was quite surprising to hear that the game was back in development, considering that half of the team ended up leaving to do something else, and the remainder of the team basically said, yeah, we don't really want to do much with it anymore. After repeated campaigns by the community to release the source code so that others could continue the work, it seems that finally the guys over at Demilogic decided, you know what? I think it's a good idea to continue the update, and that is exactly what they did. The patch contains over 700 new items, it would appear, which is an absurd amount, and essentially could be an entirely different game. Have no idea whether or not we will have to regenerate the world, and this is of course relevant because a lot of people have been asking whether or not we will be restarting the Terraria series. It may very well happen. We have said that we do have the intention of doing so. It may very well unfortunately be that we have to completely restart the world though because it seems like there are so many new things that we would not experience them on our own, which that kind of sucks considering we were pretty far in. I don't know. I'm going to have to think about it really as to whether or not we want to continue having to redo the entire thing and play that yet again for the third time doesn't necessarily seem like it would be the, the kind of thing that people would like. However, there are other arguments that suggest that because of all of the changes, it will be an entirely different game and that whole element of discovery will come back. I'm not sure. I'll think about it. The patch comes on October the 1st and they have recently released the Android version. The Vita version is also out as well, so it's pretty much on all platforms now. The director of Star Trek Into Darkness has stated that he believes that the Star Trek game without question didn't help the movie and arguably hurt it in an interview with IGN. He does what he can to distance himself from the project, saying that the game was obviously a big disappointment to me and it was something we were actually involved in at the very beginning, then sort of realized that it was not going to the place that we wanted it to go. Needless to say, the game was very much finished without their involvement and released to a critical panning across the board. He also addressed something that I think a lot of us can definitely agree with him on, and that was the idea that adaptations of any kind should exist on their own terms, but a lot of the times these sort of exist as ancillary products, in which case they will suck. So what he's talking about is film tie-ins essentially are parasitic, as opposed to being able to stand on their own terms as being a really good product. Oh, well, he's totally right there, especially when it comes down to Star Trek. I do have to say, though, someone thought it was a good idea to turn Star Trek into a third-person cover shooter. And if you're saying you're involved from the very start, then that had something to do with you lot. 
And frankly, that does show a lack of understanding for both the kind of people that would play a Star Trek game and the kind of genres in which Star Trek actually works. Third-person shooter is not one of them having played almost every Star Trek game that exists, including all of the terrible ones, of which it's about half of them. Yes, there was one third-person shooter, DS9 The Fallen. It was dreadful. Funnily enough, there were two first-person shooters that were actually pretty good, that being Elite Force and Elite Force 2. They actually weren't too shabby. Then you had Klingon Honor Guard, which wasn't that great, and then you had Generations, which had that FPS component which wasn't too good either. There are certain genres in which Star Trek really works, but then again, I suppose when you look at the J.J. Abrams Star Trek, the kind of stuff that they're showing, it's a very narrow look at what Star Trek actually is, and everyone who follows me even to the slightest probably knows that I am a massive Trekkie to the point where I've seen everything that there really is to see when it comes to Star Trek, and read a lot of it as well. And really, you look at those movies and you say, well, this is a hijink space adventure, and that's pretty cool on its own terms, but that wasn't what Star Trek actually was. To be fair, though, a lot of the movies were exactly that. Yeah? The slower pace of the television series was something that wasn't really implemented all that well in the movies, and deliberately so, and as a result, half the movies were kind of bad. Some of the better Star Trek movies were pretty high on action, really as simple as that, whereas you had entire episodes of Star Trek where not a single phaser was fired. And that was one of the strengths of the series, because it wasn't just a space adventure with laser guns, it was something beyond that. Whatever the case, you really cannot do a four to five hour cover shooter, even within that narrow look that you see from something like Star Trek Into Darkness, where the action scenes are properly paced, and the whole thing is kind of over in 90 minutes, and... For some people gave a satisfying conclusion, I personally liked it a decent amount, but obviously there were some things that as a long-time Star Trek viewer I found to be a little unnerving, but it's okay, I can kind of write that all off as alt-universe stuff, but whatever. The end of the day, the game was terrible. It's really surprising because it came from Digital Extremes, who for the most part actually have made solid products. There are some in their library that are not that great. Star Trek is probably the worst one though. And this is the same company that has been developing the excellent Warframe for the past couple of years, which is just a phenomenal third-person game. And then you, you look at Star Trek, it's like, are these the same people? We're also talking about the company that came up with The Darkness 2, which was pretty damn good, I've got to say. You know, they know what they're doing when it comes to shooters. Even if you look at Dark Sector back in the day, that was pretty solid, but this was just awful. I tried to play it, I really did, and I maybe got about half an hour in, and just got so horribly frustrated with it. It's like, this was supposed to be some janky co-op game, and there's a bunch of really awkward puzzle solving in it, and there's a bunch of platforming, and it's really laborious platforming as well. It takes so long to do. The actual action itself, the shooting was not that great either, but I guess I shouldn't have really expected more from a licensed tie-in game. Most of the Star Trek games, funnily enough, were not direct tie-ins to something. They stood on their own, and those were the good ones. Stuff like Starfleet Command is fantastic, based on the Starfleet Battles tabletop. Really great series. Stuff like Star Trek Armada, which I view as still a pretty damn good RTS. It had its own story. Elite Force, tied into Voyager, but its own story within the Voyager universe, and very strong as a direct result of that. And yes, then you look to Star Trek The Game. You can toss Star Trek DAC in there as well, which was a knockoff tie-in to the first of the J.J. Abrams movies. Just dreadful. But yeah, the point he made is entirely valid. Movie tie-ins generally suck. The reason they generally suck is they're developed over a short time frame and are parasitic upon the movie itself, often being a game that is bound very much to the plot of the movie, but has to do so in a way that doesn't spoil it or doesn't overshadow it. So it ends up just being absolute nonsense. And these examples keep coming. However, it seems these games are also pretty profitable. They're basically shovelware. They're marketed towards a younger audience that is more excited about the particular movie or, of course, the parents of that younger audience. It's like, oh, they've seen the movie. Let's buy them the game because they obviously really like that. And unfortunately, more often than not, it involves a really bad game being sold for $60 to hapless parents that don't really know what's good and what isn't. But hey, the good news is that Vin Diesel has managed to put together the Starbreeze team that worked on Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay and Dark Athena, and they're making another Riddick game, which by all accounts will probably end up being a lot better than the third Riddick movie.
And finally, let's have a look at the releases, shall we? Yeah, I think you can probably guess what the dominating release of this week is going to be. Not on PC, but on the consoles. It is, of course, GTA 5, which is coming to PlayStation 3 and 360 on September the 17th, so it is out today. Also, there is the wonderful 101, which I believe has actually been out in Europe for a couple of weeks, but is only just now coming to the US for some reason. Funnily enough, I'm more excited about this game than I am about GTA 5. Wonderful 101 is by Platinum. I play everything Platinum have made, bar none, and Platinum, in my opinion, have not made a bad game thus far. They have some really great ideas about how games should actually be designed. And of course, they're the ex-Clover guys who made a Kami and God Hand, so why the hell wouldn't I believe that? I'll actually be pretty excited to play the Wonderful 101. That's a reason to dust off the Wii U and actually play that again. Also, Hot Wheels, world's best driver, coming to 360, Wii U, 3DS, PlayStation 3 on September the 17th. I anticipate it's selling a grand total of seven copies. You know, what's probably going to end up happening here is that the kids who are not allowed GTA 5 are going to be given that, and it will be a horrific thing indeed. Oh, God, we were talking about licensed titles. I, I don't know about this one. It's developed by Firebrand. We're, of course, known for the absolute classics, Cars 2. Need for Speed The Run, considered to be the worst Need for Speed game in the last 10 years, Fast and the Furious Showdown, and the Wii version of Trackmania. Yes, I think that one might be a pass somehow. I, there's just something about that that doesn't really seem like a good idea. The developers of Space Gem are bringing you Ironclad Tactics, which is a real-time tactical card game, and it's set in an alt-history version of the American Civil War, Yes, it involves steam. Yes, it involves robots and battling and so on and so forth. I'm interested on the sole basis of what they just described. Alt History America Steampunk Real-Time Tactical Card Game. I am all over Ironclad Tactics. Absolutely. Give it to me. Just, just inject it into my veins. What else have we got? Urban Trial Freestyle finally makes its way to PC, which is a little bit weird. It's been on console, of course, for a little while. And then we also have Take Down Red Saber. September the 20th, coming out to Xbox Live and PC. Do check out my video on that one, because it is really promising. Very promising indeed. It basically feels like Rainbow Six Rogue Spear all over again, and in a very good way. It is a tactical shooter along the lines of the older Rainbow Six titles, the SWAT titles, and the older Ghost Recons. In fact, it had the creative director from the older Ghost Recon developing the damn thing. So yeah, he, he knows what he's doing, Christian Allen absolutely knows what he's doing and in my video i will shoot him in the back of the head it'll be wonderful also please don't forget foul play which is coming to steam on september the 18th a rather british brawler and i did a video of that from pax i would suggest that you watch it it's really really cool so please do not forget about that one all right folks that's me done for the day thank you very much for watching the content patch but before i go i'd like to give you the oc remix track of the day from the latest Remix album project over at ocremix.com, the Gunstar Heroes album, Be Aggressive, this is a track by the name of No Time to Rest, which is a remix of the staff role originally composed by Norio Hanzawa. It is quite the thing, and it is remixed by Ivan Hackstock, and I think you'll like it. It's an anthemic rock track, and it's pretty damn cool. I like it a lot, and I particularly like the guitar tone in this one, so do please enjoy it. Download it for free in the description below this video, and I'll see you next time.